Psalms 119. And we're not going to continue on with the rapture study tonight. We'll pick that up next Tuesday. Again, that's just a good segue into the announcement. Please remember on Tuesday um, is going to be midweek service and not next Wednesday. We're doing that for our watch night service. So, uh, again, if you can come out, please join us. It's going to be a good time. Looking forward to it. And we'll start at normal time, 7 o'clock. And Lord willing, we'll go all the way to midnight. Now it's going to go faster than you can imagine. There's multiple people that had said they want to preach, and I'm encouraged by that. Probably won't even get to everyone. To be honest with you, at 15 minutes a piece. So what I'm going to do is Tuesday, we'll kind of do it like I did when I was back in school. We used to have a, a monthly meeting at Pea Ridge, and a bunch of preachers would come there from PBI, and it was a blessing. We'd sing and have meal. And uh, anyways, we would just put a bunch of our names in a hat. We'd just draw a name. If your name got called, you come up and preach. And if it doesn't, well, maybe next time. So we'll probably do that unless a lot of people just bow out. I'll find out next Tuesday. So again, if you want to preach something, give a short testimony, whatever, uh, please let me know. Now, again, I'll make that announcement Tuesday. But looking like we'll probably do something like from 7 to 8, normal service like normal. We'll take up some prayer requests. We'll sing some songs. Then I'll teach um, on kind of conclude a wrap up for the time being on the pre-tribulation rapture. And then we'll probably take a break from like 8 to maybe 8.30 where we'll have some food and games and fellowship. And then we'll all come back in here at 10.30. I'm sorry, from 8, yeah, 8 to 10.30, something like that. We'll probably take a break time. we we'll eat and have some games and food and all that. And then from 10.30 to midnight, I plan on being back in here. That's a rough time frame. Um, just give everyone an idea. But at 15 minutes a pop, that's only, what, six preachers. So uh, we'll see. Maybe we'll gather a little early if, if uh, we kind of wrap things up. But uh, keep that in prayer. Also, please remember next Sunday is our last week. We'll be taking up collection for Brother Joe Hicks and his big push is boots. Or if you have any winter clothes or gloves or anything like that, want to bring them in. Or if you want to just help contribute to what the church is purchasing. Again, we're purchasing those like kind of emergency blankets. They kind of fold up into about the size of the ball of your hand. And then they unfold and you can get inside of them. But they retain about 90% of body heat. And for someone who's homeless, that's real convenient to carry around versus what we did a couple years ago with wool blankets. Now, those are amazing, but a wool blanket gets wet, gets heavy, it needs to be washed, and again, not very practical. So um, let's just keep that in prayer. Whatever you want to do is the Lord leads, and uh, feel free to do that. So this evening, we're going to kind of segue into a study. We probably won't get it all done tonight, and uh, we've looked at a lot of this stuff before, um, but we're going to do a little bit of a study on the spirit world, on the spirit world, and give you some just uh, Bible uh, doctrine understanding and on the spirit world and we'll hop back to the pre-tribulation rapture next week and if we don't conclude this in the following we'll kind of give you some more thoughts on the spirit world but psalms 119 i'll just read a text here and uh, i know you all know this reference it's a wonderful reference this bible is an amazing book but look at verse 18 psalms 119 verse 18 the Bible says, Open thou my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have an amazing book. And I make this comment. I'm sure you understand what I mean by this. But um, thank God for salvation. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. But this book is much more than that. Uh, this book is it's a large book, and God gave it to us to study to be students of the Word of God, and I tell you, He tells us all things. And you start looking at science, you start looking at uh, things that we don't even understand yet. The world's always behind the Bible, and we have an amazing book. And uh, so that's my prayer. I pray that God will open our eyes, that we can behold wondrous things out of thy law. Well, the first thing I just want to make a mention in regards to the spiritual world, and you understand this, but the spiritual world is real we just can't see it. It's very real. Look at 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6 in regards to the spiritual world. Now, uh, I'm actually thankful that we can't see the spiritual world right now. Uh, both in the good and the bad, I, I believe wholeheartedly that even tonight, now this might sound like, uh, like spooky or something, but it's not meant to be. Even tonight, probably even in this building, there are spirits that we just can't see. Amen. 
I, I mean, why would we think not? Um, now, I don't, uh, again, I don't say that uh, we understand all their workings, but all I'm telling you is you're around. There are spirits all around you. Just like there's people around you, there's spirits all around you. And we forget that sometimes, being physical people, and I understand that. But look here in 2 Kings chapter 6, and a uh, very familiar story. You know what's going on here, but let's just read this about the uh, Syrians here and the, the Jews. Let's pick up 2 Kings chapter 6, and look at verse 8. The Bible says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel. And took counsel with his servant, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned him of, and saved him there, not once nor twice. Again, so what you hear, you see the, the, the Syrians are looking for the king of Israel and the man of God here, you see that he tells them where to go and he saves him because he's telling them where to go. And what this does is it upsets the king of Syria. Watch here, verse 11. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? You uh, see, he thinks someone's betraying him because everywhere he tries to go, the king of Israel knows he's coming and he won't go there. But he's getting this information from the man of God, the Bible says. Verse 12, it says, And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elijah the prophet that is in Israel, watch this now, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Isn't that interesting? This king, this king of Syria speaking some things in his bedchamber, and somehow Elijah's getting this information. I'm telling you, there's a spiritual world that you have no idea about. Uh, what I mean by that, I understand we do as Bible believers, we can look into it, but it's much more real than the physical eye can see or we can even really grasp. And this king saying things in his bedchamber, Elijah gets that information, tells the king of Israel. Verse 13, he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. It was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and none gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Sounds bad for Elijah and his servant. Here the king of Syria has a city encompassed with their horses and their chariots, and they found him. But look what verse 16 says in verse 17. And, in verse 16, And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I imagine that servant said, what in the world are you talking about, Elijah? All I see is me and you here. <laughs> Did you look out your window? <laughs> Did you not see all the chariots out there? And look what happens in the very next verse. Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. You know what that young man's eyes were open to? The spirit world that was always there. He just couldn't see it. And what I'm telling you is this spirit world is so real. And, and oftentimes we wonder, as I preached on Sunday, why is our spirit affected? Could be because it's affected by the devils that are around you. And, uh, and again, we have no idea as we get into this study of the spiritual world, uh, how much we come in interaction with or how much we don't and how much God reveals to us and uh, but this I know, that spirit world is very real. Uh, and uh, one day we'll be more acquainted with it. One day we'll know more about it. But I just want to show you that regards to the spirit world, it's all around us. We just can't see it. We have natural eyes. And one day we'll be able to see the spirit world and we can't now. Look at John chapter 4. God sometimes allows the spirit world to be manifest. And again, as we study on, we'll see that through this study. 
But I just want you to see this evening that the spirit world is real. It's all around us and it affects us. In John chapter 4, a lot of these references you, you will know, but it's good to turn there and read them. John chapter 4, look at verse 24. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The more you study the Bible, the more you realize that God is not like you and I. Amen. He's a spirit, and, and God's worship must not just be worship that man creates, but it must be worship based off of truth. And oftentimes you see the children of Israel, they got in trouble for that. They got in trouble for what they called worship to God. It wasn't worship to God. Because it wasn't based in truth. And again, that's why as Bible believers we must make sure our worship towards God is worship that's based on truth. And that's the worship God accepts and God doesn't accept other worship. All right, now I just want to lay out uh, kind of we did an in-depth study on this in regards to the gap in, in the study on um, the universe and all that, but we're talking about God and God is the spirit. We're talking about the spiritual world, but the Bible tells us where God dwells and where he's at, and we know it's in the north, but look at Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. So looking at God as a spirit, we must worship him in spirit and truth and just in dealing with the spirit world. The Bible tells us where God dwells, Isaiah chapter 57, and look at verse 15. The Bible says in Isaiah 57, verse 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also, is of a con also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Uh, my point here is God says he, he's the high and lofty one. He inhabits eternity. And he says, I dwell in the high and holy place. Th there's a holy place. There's a high place where God literally dwells. And we can find that out when we study the Bible where that is. Look at Psalms chapter 75, Psalms chapter 75, and of course we know he's not contained to his throne. He, we know he's not contained to his city, for he's God. But he does have a place, he does have a city where he dwells. Psalms chapter 75, and this is a wonderful reference for anyone uh, who's seeking to just uh, give God glory in all things, especially uh, for, for if you have a career or a job and you're seeking, uh, you know, just to glorify God in all things. I remember as just a young, young uh, uh, sailor in the, in the military. I had my picture taken with a uh, commander and gave me an award for something. I can't remember what it was for. And, and still in my fir very first Bible I ever got, my Schofield Bible, that picture still sits in this chapter. Right next to this verse, you say, why? Look at Psalms chapter 75, verse 6. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He put it down one and setteth up another. You know, I realized from a young age, any promotion, any praise, any good, it came from the, my God, my Father. And God's been good to me. And it doesn't mean if you weren't promoted, he's not good to you. He's still good to you. Amen. But, I, but I'm telling you, when, when God opens doors and gives you favors with your bosses and the jobs that you have, you know who made that? God did that. But we see there in verse 6, he says, Promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the south. I'm sorry, nor from the west, nor from the south. The only direction, obviously, that's left out is the north. Because that's where God dwells. Promotion comes from the north. It comes from God. Look at Leviticus chapter, uh, chapter 1. What you'll start noticing as you learn these things and you read your Bible, God even desires the worship pointed to a certain direction and it's pointed towards him, obviously. Leviticus chapter 1. Oh, 
Well, let's just pick up here as we read about this burnt sacrifice. Let's pick up in verse 5. It says, He shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar, lay the wood in order upon the fire. This is not in regards to this study, but I've noticed that oftentimes that when you worship God, God likes order. <laughs> You'll find that often. You'll find that when Elijah uh, calls down fire from God. He's got to build that uh, altar again. He's got to put things in order. And you find that oftentimes in regards to worship to God, there's got to be order. And here we see that, that they put the things in order. In verse 8, And the priest Aaron's son shall lay the, the parts, the head of the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. But, in, but his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice and an offering made by fire of a sweet Savior unto the Lord. And his offering shall be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or of the goats for a burnt sacrifice. He shall bring it a male without blemish. He shall kill it on the sides of the altar. Watch it. Northward before the Lord. And the priest Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. Again, I believe that reason, that direction was there, and there had to things be in order, and it had to be northward, is because that's where God dwells. And God dwells northward. And uh, I believe wholeheartedly, and I don't think you can get there, <laughs> because we're bound by this flesh, but I believe if you went due north, you would run into the throne of God, the city of God. That's where he dwells. He dwells northward. Look at Psalms chapter 48. Psalms chapter 48, and there's so much more. You ever consider the Tower of Babel? And that gets into an awful deep study, Amen. pun intended. <laughs> but those, those, it was after the, the angels who left their first estate. And that influence wasn't just the influence of man. It was ungodly influence by devils and fallen angels. And you know what they were trying to do? They left their first estate. They were kicked out of heaven. They were trying to get back there with the help of man. And they are building a tower up into heaven. Just consider that sometime. Psalms chapter 48. And again, I believe this Bible has so much more information if we would just pray and study it and seek God's face on these matters. Psalms chapter 48. And look at, oh, let's start in uh, verse 1. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Again, he's telling you where the city is. He says it's on the sides of the north. Now, you know what is interesting? This world is, again, influenced by the spirit world, and they don't even know it. You know what's on the back of your dollar bill? There's this pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. There's a pyramid on the back of the dollar bill, and the top of that pyramid is what it's missing. Malachi, Derek, can you guys point that over there? There, there's, excuse me, sorry. So there, there's, on the back of the dollar bill, there, there's, a, there's a pyramid, and the top is missing. You know what's above that top? There's an all-seeing eye with like a radiance coming about it. You know why this world's infatuated with pyramids? Why they're always missing the top and on the top of these pyramids? Or this glory there, or this, this all-knowing being there? Because it's a ripoff of the true thing. There is a mountain. And there are the sides of the north. But who dwells there is a holy God who dwells there. And again, this is, this is, we develop this more in our study on the gap, but this is just a quick overview. And I believe without a shadow of doubt that somehow, some way, that the universe itself is shaped similar to that. Now, I'm not saying it's exactly like a pyramid and the, all the dimensions are exact, but you'll see this over and over again. 
And what I believe you have on the outside of this pyramid is the sides of the north. And that's going to be on all the sides. And obviously God dwells in the north. He's due north. Now I believe if you were to get outside of this universe, no matter which way you went, east, west, south, as long as you could penetrate outside of it, you can't, you would enter into that third heaven. But where God's at, he's at the top there. He's at the top of that pyramid, just like you see in the back of your $1 bill. It's a ripoff. It's a counterfeit of what God's doing there. Now look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. God likens this universe to a garment. And again, you can go back and listen to that study on the gap and I showed you how God likens this in more detail, and I showed you how if you compare the priest's garment to the universe, God uses some words to liken them together, and I think it was for glory and beauty. Right. You find that priest's garment, God made it, they had to design it in such a way for glory and beauty. And then he called the heavens for glory and beauty. And what you see is that's a picture of the universe as it drapes over that man. And this has to do with of the garment of Jesus Christ also. But look here in Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse 10. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10. The Bible says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Just think about that for a moment. Remember we read in Revelation in a different study where the righteousness, fine linen, fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. It compares the righteousness of the saints to linen. Here it compares the heavens as the work of thy hands. Like God's making something. What is he making? Verse 11, they shall perish, but thou remainest. And they shall wax old, as doth a garment. So he likens the heavens as a garment. And that's what you're going to see there. Look at here in uh, John chapter 19. While you're turning to John 19, you could actually read verse 12 also. I'll read it real quick in Hebrews 1. As a vestures, thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. He's talking about folding up the heavens as what? As a garment. Now look here in John chapter 19. I kind of mentioned this when we went through this verse here, just briefly. But John chapter 19. Look at verse 23. The Bible says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart. Now watch this. And also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Now that coat, again, is going to be a picture. That's what he wore on the outside of his body. This is the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ, that coat he wore. And it was woven from the top without seam. So how do you do that? Well, when, when you knit or something, you start and you make the hole at the top. And you continue going, you continue going, you continue going, and then you can fashion the arms, then you can fashion the body, but it has no seams in it. And what you have here, if you'll pan back over here in John 19, 23, is this, again, is a picture from the top of that garment. It has a hole there where the head goes over. By the way, Jesus is what? He's the head of the church, right? right? And there's that hole there. So this is looking from the top down. And it drapes over the body like a garment. That's a picture of the universe. And again, so that's what you have there. All right, so that's where God dwells. He dwells in the north. We know there's a city up there. And by the way, that's this beautiful rendition of a city. <laughs> that's the city of God. It's much more beautiful in person, I promise you. And last time I drew something to this effect, I, listen, this is, not a, uh, this is not a true model of the universe. I started getting comments about the flat earth and this. This doesn't represent any of that. You know what this represents? The Bible says God hung the earth of what? 
upon nothing. That's where the earth is at. In the middle of that garment there, in the middle of his body there, that's where the earth is at. And we'll study some more of these details, but that's not to measurement, obviously. That's just to show you that in the middle of this garment, in the middle of this universe, is the earth, and that's where you and I dwell. But up here, by the way, you know what you have to do to get up there? You've got to cross the Red Sea. You've got to cross the water. The only way to get up here is if God parts the water. As you read there in the book of Exodus, and the children of Israel going to the promised land. That's what's going to happen one day. But this is where God dwells. God dwells in the north. Now look at Psalms 148, and probably this all we'll get just as regards kind of this layout so you understand this. Psalms 148. This is a fascinating chapter here and a lot of details, but we'll start in verse 1. We'll read down to verse 6, and I'll make some comments. What it says here in verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him all his angels. Praise ye him all his host. Praise ye him sun and moon. Praise ye him ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. Again, so what you see here in verse 1, it says, Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens, plural. Praise him in the heights. Now, again, if you all will pan back over there, Derek, what you, we know this. We studied this out. But the Bible is very clear that the Bible says there's three heavens. You have the first heaven. Again, I'll just kind of draw it here, and you will see the first heaven. You'll find out, you read in Genesis chapter 1, is the firmament or where the birds fly. Every day you go outside and you see those birds flying in the sky. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is where the sun and the moon are. That's, that's, that's here in outer space. That's called the second heaven. Now, again, the Bible doesn't call it the second heaven. It just calls it the heaven. But by, by reasoning and deduction and understanding that there's a third heaven and there's two other heavens, you come to the conclusion that that second heaven the Bible talks about in the heaven is where the sun and the moon are and the stars are. This is the second heaven. And of course, the third heaven is where the throne of God's at. And we'll see that uh, too. All right, so the first heaven is where the, uh, the birds are. That's our atmosphere. The second heaven is where the sun, moon, and stars are. And the third heaven is where that city of God's at. Let me just show you that quickly. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Hold your hand there in Psalms 148. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Those other references are in Genesis chapter 1. Well, you're turning to, well, you turn into 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That first heaven is described in Genesis 1.20. That second heaven is described in Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8, and then verses 14 through 19. All right, so that's the second heaven. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. We find here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the Apostle Paul talking. Look at verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to vision and revelation of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Watch it. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Verse 3. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up, watch it, into paradise. And he heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. 
That's where Paul was caught up to. Most people attribute this, and I agree with this, when he was stoned and they dragged him out of the city dead during that time when he was stoned, he was caught up to the third heaven and he heard things, saw things that were unspeakable. Again, so that third heaven is the city of God. Listen, no wonder why Paul went back in the city and went preaching again. He just saw the city of God. Well, what, a, what an advantage he has. Praise the Lord for that, though. All right, look back in Psalms 148. Psalms 148. The point is, in verse 1, Psalms 148, verse 1, the Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. So again, we see the three heavens there. Or at least we see the plural heavens. And then we start studying the rest of the Bible and come to the conclusion that there's three heavens. All right, now look at verse 2. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Now there's a, a, just people just say this and they don't mean anything by it. They just don't study the Bible and understand. There's more than just angels in heaven. <laughs> he tells you right there. Praise ye heavens and or angels and praise ye all his host. As we progress in this study, that's what we're going to look at, the different angelic or heavenly beings. Skip down to verse 4. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, watch it, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Now, you know what's very clear? Verse 4, that there's waters... Above the heavens. That's plural. That means there has to be water above the first heaven. That means there has to be water above the second heaven. Now, I've heard people try to use this verse for the whole canopy theory, and I'm telling you, I, I don't subscribe to the canopy theory at all. It's, uh, there's no scripture for it all. Uh, science debunks the canopy theory. That's what the young earth creationists try to use to explain Genesis chapter 1, but it's not in the Bible. And what they do is they try to put a canopy of water around the earth and it separates it from the, so, the stars and the, and the sun. And they say that's why man lived longer because of the radiation, blah, blah, blah. It's all just they're all guesswork. But do you see that verse there? The waters are above the heavens. It's not just above one heaven. The waters are above the heavens. Now again, this comes back all full circle to the study on the gap. Those waters are above the heavens. Because in Genesis 1.1, the reign of Lucifer, then when God drowned out everything, he filled his whole garment, this whole universe was completely covered in water. There was no firmament. There was no heaven. There was no space. And when God divided the waters from the waters, that's when he created the heavens. And there's waters below and there's waters above. And I'll draw the below some other time, put it down here. But what God did is he divided that. And in the midst of that is the firmament. And in the midst of that, you have the earth has its firmament, it has its heaven, and the universe has its heaven, the first and the second. But there's waters above and there's waters below. Now look at Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Again, we're laying the foundation of where God dwells, where his angels are, and where these other hosts are. According to the word of God, and then next time we pick up, we'll actually study these different beings. Job chapter 38. Pay attention to the wording here. Look at uh, Job chapter 38 and skip down to verse 30. I'll back up one verse. Look at verse 29. Out of whom's womb came the ice, the hoary frost of heaven who, who gendered it. Look at verse 30. The waters are hid as it was a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. All right, the face of the deep is frozen. As we've studied before, that face of the deep is up here where those waters that are that are above the heavens. And what I'm telling you is God's throne is, it's on a sea of glass. And it's those waters that are frozen. And God looks down to his creation through that sea of glass. Look at uh, Job chapter 26. Job chapter 26. Look 
at verse, we'll start in verse 5. Dead things are from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. That's an interesting verse. Study out sometime. Hell is naked before him and destruction hath no covering. Watch it. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds and the cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne. He spreadeth his clouds upon it. He compassed the waters with bounds unto the day and night uh, to an end. Uh, let's keep reading there. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his powers. And by his understanding, he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit, he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed, watch it, the crooked serpent. All right, so again, verse 7, that's when we know that God hangeth the earth upon nothing. And the Bible says he stretcheth out the north. And all this is, has to do with God's throne. This has to do with the universe. has to do with those waters that uh, are above the heavens. Again, verse 8, he says, he bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds. The cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. So again, what you read there is God's holding back the face of his throne. You know how he's holding back the face of the throne? By those clouds and by those waters. You want a good picture of that? Go back and read when God communes with Moses on the Mount Sinai. You know what you see in Mount Sinai? Those thick clouds round about. And it separates his glory and his throne from who? From Moses and everyone else. And that's what this is a picture of. That's what those waters do. They, they hold back his throne and his face from what? His creation. Because they're sinful now. Amen. Look at uh, Job 37. Job chapter 37. We're almost done. Look at verse 9. Job 37 verse 9. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. And the breath of God, frost is given, and the breath of the waters is straightened. So God breathed upon some waters, and they were straightened. Look at, if you would, skip down to verse 18. Verse 18, Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass. All right, so that all has to do with that waters that are frozen and that it hides the face of God and it's likened unto a molten looking glass. You know, the Bible says now that we look through a glass, what? Darkly. But one day we're going to look at it face to face. Right now there's a separation between us and God and it's those waters. It's likened unto a molten looking glass. All right, now this, this, is, this is important because this tells you where that water came from during Noah's flood. Look at Genesis chapter 7, if you would. Genesis chapter 7. So we see that there's some frozen water there that's straightened and it's like a molten looking glass. Genesis chapter 7. Pay attention carefully. I, I asked some children this question. And I would probably, we could probably do it right now to get the same answer. The only time you won't get the same answer is if you've got a college education or someone has a doctrine they're against and they have a reason to not read what the Bible says. But look here in verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. So this day, this is where the water is going to come from. That deep was broken up. Hold on a minute. We'll finish the verse in a minute. What do we just read? There's waters above the heavens that are straightened, that are frozen. And God said that the deep was broken up. You know why you have to break up water? Because it's frozen. Now watch it. Keep reading. And the windows of heaven were opened. Where did the water come from? According to this verse, did it come from out of the ground or from heaven? 
You know, I asked many children that, and they said, oh, it came from heaven. <laughs> That's the context. God broke up part of this great deep. He sent it down to earth. He opens up the windows, and water comes down. That's where that water comes from. It comes from that frozen great deep that's above the heavens. Amen. And above that is the throne of God. It's the sea of glass that you read in the book of Revelation. That's where his throne sits upon. That's where he's at. Again, let's, uh, let's go there and we'll conclude with that. Look at Revelation. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. We'll get back. To Psalm 148 next time. Look at Revelation chapter 4. Now the reason I emphasize that, again, those that are against the gap, I don't care if they're against the gap or not, but they come up with these strange doctrines. And these strange, strange doctrines come from scientists. They don't come from the Bible. And, and they, they say that, that the great deep being broken up is the earth's crust being broken up. And that water shot out from the ground, and that's why like, there's craters on these different planets outer space, because it was such pressure that it shot out and made craters on these other planets. You know where you find that in the Bible? Nowhere! That great deep that was broken up was that water that's above the heavens, and it came down when God opened up the windows. That's what the Bible says. Now, was there water that came out of the earth? I'm sure there was, <laughs> because it was a catastrophe during Noah's flood. But that water that came down was much more than just water in the earth. It came down so much it flooded at the highest mountain. And again, they've done all types of studies. And one of the reasons they tried to debunk Noah's flood, they said, listen, if, if it was true that the water was contained in our earth, you know what happens like in the, the, uh, the water cycle, right? Water starts evaporating. It goes up to the clouds. And then eventually it comes down. You know what you would have repeated over and over and over again? Noah's flood over and over and over again. That water didn't come from the earth. That water was supernatural that came down from the third heaven that was broken up to this water here and it came down to the earth. And then God took some of it and he swaged it off the earth and brought it back up there. And that's what happened to it. All right, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. By the way, that's why you don't see any clouds mentioned in Genesis until Noah's flood. It's a scientific book. You know what there was clouds, what that would mean? There would have been rain because that's what forms clouds. And that's why the Bible is very accurate when it doesn't mention clouds until Noah's flood. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 4. We're done a couple of references here. After this, and look, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. I've read that a couple times. There's a door there. There's windows there. You know why? There's a literal city there. And that literal city has doors and windows that sometimes God can just open and send some things down or just open and let some people in to a literal city with their literal doors. Now this looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat on was to look upon like a jasper and a sardis stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne, in the sight like an emerald. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. They had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire before, burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Watch it, don't miss verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And again, we'll pick up next time we study this about those beasts and what those beasts are. All I can say in brethren, that's going to be a sight one day to go before the throne of God and there's the elders and there's these beasts and there is the sea of glass. And God sits there. Look at Revelation chapter 15. Last reference. Revelation chapter 15. Verse 1. 
And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw it as it were what? A sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over his number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Brethren, one day you're going to stand on the sea of glass. That's where the throne of God's at. That's where those martyrs are at. And again, so what we see there is God has a city. And God has a throne. It's a literal city. It's not figurative. It's literal. Right. And there that separates his city from us, from the whole universe, is a sea. It's called the deep that's frozen. And one day, brother, we're going to go to that city. But up in that city, this is where we'll pick up. They're all types of angelic beings. And I, you know, some of them, I don't, definitely don't have all the answers, but we know some of them by name. We know that some of them are cherubs. Some of them are seraphims. And some of them are angels. The Bible calls them beasts. The Bible calls them living creatures. And then you read some crazy things about some watchers. <laughs> There's all types of things out there. But here's what I want you to leave with. There's a literal city, and our God lives there. And there's angels there, and there's cherubims there, and there's seraphims there. And they interact with this world in ways that a lot of people don't even know. And we'll get into the study of the angels and what the Bible says that angels are and what cherubims are and seraphims are. But just know there's a real God, and we know that. There's real angels. We believe that. The real, there's real seraphims and cherubims. And just like all that real, there's a real devil. And there's real devils and evil spirits. And oftentimes that affects your life. You may need to stop and pray because it might not be anything in the flesh. There may be a spiritual battle going on there between husband and wife. I've had it multiple times. I say, what in the world am I upset about? You know what gets in there? Devils get in there. All of a sudden problems start arising at church. And you're like, you step back and you're like, what is the world's going on? You know what's going on? Devils get in there. And when we go out witnessing and standing and preaching for the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what we're battling? You know that lunatic who will start singing jingle bells, jingle bells? And the other ones that will harass the other men out there? It's probably not even them. It's a devil in them. Because there's a real spiritual world out there. We must remember that because our battle is not against flesh and blood. Amen. You know, so let's, con let's conclude with a word of prayer and we'll pick that up next time. Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that, Lord, that uh, we don't have to fear this world. We don't have to fear the spiritual world. Lord, we're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Lord, I pray that you'd make us aware, aware of our surroundings. And Lord, we thank you for a book that tells us about spiritual things and where your city is. And Lord, to me, those things are exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing you one day, Lord. Until then, Lord, I pray that you'd find us faithful, serving you, worshiping you in spirit and truth. We do love you and thank you for this night you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you get the honor and glory. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 You are dismissed. Excuse me.